Our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah. Uh, this is part of the lectionary for the Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Liturgically, as we look at the beginning of uh, the Epiphany season, which last Sunday was it, we celebrated Epiphany on January the 6th, and then uh, the liturgical Sunday following that is always Baptism of the Lord Sunday, as we share and remember the baptism of Jesus. And so as we look at the particular lectionary text, Isaiah 43, 1 through 7 was the Old Testament reading for the day. Um, this is a reading from what scholars often call second or deutero-Isaiah. And the first part of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, really deal with uh, a writer who was living in the 8th century before Jesus. And then we move into, chap uh, as we look at the chapters in the 40s, it's more, in the early 50s, it's more about a couple centuries advanced to that, so around six centuries before Jesus, and we know at that time the people were in exile. Uh, the people of God and Israel had been taken to Babylon, and so we're looking at uh, a prophet that is writing in that time frame. And so as we read this particular piece on baptism of the Lord's Sunday, what I would invite you to do is look for the connections to baptism that are present in this reading today. There's a reason why uh, the folks on high put this particular text in with baptism of the Lord's Sunday. So for us, as the listener, as the worshiper uh, this morning, our job is to kind of figure out why would they put that in here? And so as, as I've looked for connections, I invite you to see the connections that are present in this text today. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the waters, through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, good and gracious God, as we gather here this morning and as we worship you today, as we consider baptism and that holy sacrament, what it means for our lives, we ask that you would help us uh, on our journey of discipleship, on our journey of faith, that you would draw us closer to you, and as we meditate on your word, may that word speak life to us once more. We pray all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. So it's interesting, as we think about uh, this text, uh, Isaiah speaks to a people wanting to come home. You have a people thinking about being in bondage, and yet God seems to be saying it is time for you to give up that bondage, take off these shackles, and return back to me. He talks about going through the waters, and it's recalling uh, for people of Israel that time of the Exodus when God called them forth out of slavery, and they were brought literally through uh, the waters of the Red Sea towards their freedom. Later, they had similar experience when they were crossing over into the Promised Land and they crossed the Jordan River. A same kind of parting of the waters happened for all the people to walk through. And as we think about John's baptism, John returns to the waters of the Jordan for people to go back to their beginning of when they first entered into the country, baptizing them and bringing them forth into freedom. So as we think about this idea of what it means to baptize and receive baptism, 
I think that this text in Isaiah has some similarities. And the first one that I see in Isaiah 43 is that we have a forgiveness for your sins. And uh, baptism also speaks about forgiveness of sin. So I think that's an important concept. Uh, Dr. E. Stanley Jones tells a story about a time when there was a, a teenage girl and she got in with the wrong crowd and pretty soon she left home and she wasn't, and parents didn't know where she was. And uh, it was likely that she had a substance abuse problem. And sometimes when that happens, you <coughs> do anything for the next fix. And so the mother began to search for her uh, and she began to search for her in places where you wouldn't want your teenager uh, spending time. And these are places on the street. And she would put her picture, the mother's picture, with the words, come home, underneath it. She desperately wanted to find her daughter. Her daughter was out in one of these places, desperate, alone, afraid. She came across a picture of one who loved her. And she picked it up and saw the words etched underneath, come home. So we think about what that means for us as we are baptized uh, with water baptized with the Holy Spirit, what that is for us is a reconnection to who we are. Sometimes we recognize and realize we stray away from God's design for who we are called to be. And all of us do that from time to time. All of us do that. And so the waters of baptism are a calling to us to come home to that original identity where our sins are forgiven and we're able to move forward in new life in Jesus Christ. Now the second piece in this particular thing that I think Isaiah uh, talks about is this idea of homecoming. Um, Isaiah 43 speaks of homecoming, that God's people return to their true country and baptism also speaks of homecoming, that God's people are renewed in Christ to their true selves. So as we think about what that means for us, uh, oh, I think I jumped ahead. <laughs> um, I've got to go back to one. Identity. I apologize. Sometimes, uh, even when you're home, you're lost. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's what today feels like sometimes. <laughs> but it's okay. All right, we'll get on to that other one. But first, I want to speak about this. Uh, Isaiah 43 uh, talks about this idea that we have a new identity for Israel as a free people because they are reconnecting with who they really are. Baptism speaks of a new identity in Christ that you and I are free people. Uh, and what this means is in a sense, uh, the idea of freedom in Christ, Paul writes about that explicitly in the New Testament. And it's that idea that we are free from sin, the bondage of sin, which really, I believe, calls us to pay attention to all those selfish desires. It calls us to pay attention to everything we want and disregard the needs of those around us or the people around us. And those all become secondary whenever sin has a hold of us. And so in Christ, what it is, is that we are free from that bondage to sin and we are allowed to live out our lives as if our own needs and wants were not the primary goal of our life. That's a radical kind of freedom when you think about it. That I don't have to be a slave to every whim that comes my way. Because think about how often those whims 
and desires really are not that good for us. Get us into trouble. So as Isaiah speaks about this identity for uh, Israel as a free people, as coming home and reforming who they are, baptism does the very same thing. Um, as we think about uh, what that means for us, there was a story about Bishop Ernest Fitzgerald that tells, and he was talking about a Christmas party in uh, his church in Winston-Salem. And it was a downtown church, and it was full of people. They had hundreds of people gathering there. They had all the various class Christmas parties going on at the same time. Can you imagine what that would look like in our church if we had all like the Sunday school classes and the choir and everybody else had all their Christmas parties happening in the church? Well, that was what was going on in the church that evening. And so they had all that stuff uh, happening, and uh, he was walking around, Bishop Fitzgerald, and he saw there was a little boy, probably not even two years old, around two maybe, and he was crying his eyes out, and he was banging on the big wooden oak doors of the front of the church as if he was trying to get out. <laughs> well, this is alarming when you see a child by themselves crying, trying to get out into the street, and so he thought that he may have been, you know, somebody's lost child, so he went around and looking. The nursery didn't know who he was. The parents didn't know who he was. And when he went outside, he saw a car, seeing him hold the child, back out and leave. And he said, you know, I'm not the fastest in the world, but it began to dawn on me, <laughs> this child is being abandoned. So there you are, it's nearing Christmas, and you're holding a two-year-old. <laughs> what do you do? Well, he called different folks in the church and put the word out, and pretty soon the word came pouring in, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And the church wrapped its arms around that little child, and uh, word got out to the news stations, and they interrupted the broadcast with the child's face and saying, does anyone know who this child is? And, there was a write-up in the paper the next day about all the situation. And he said the first line was really telling. In the article, the reporter wrote, last night someone trusted the church and the church came through. It's a powerful word powerful word. It speaks to that idea that we as the baptized body of Christ, the identity of Christ, who we are in the world is important. Not only how we see ourselves, but how the world sees us is so important. That the world sees us as that place where folks can trust us to open our eyes and to welcome them home. Now the last thing, I think I, I, I really gave you a preview of this earlier in the sermon. Uh, <laughs> Isaiah 43 speaks of homecoming and God's people return to their true country in the sense that the people that are in bondage get to go home and get to go back to their original place where they live and live in freedom. And baptism speaks of homecoming and that God's people are renewed in Christ to their true self. So that's who we are in Christ. There was a story uh, about uh, a home for children who are uh, abandoned in New York City. It's Covenant House, uh, and it was for runaway kids and abandoned kids, and this was told by Sister Mary Rose, who worked at Covenant House, and that was part of her job. She writes about Kathy, who came to Covenant House. She said on a Tuesday morning, and she was dressed in dirty rags, and little Kathy would carry around a paint can. They didn't know what was in the paint can. <laughs> they didn't know anything about it. A lot of kids will carry around, she said, stuffed animals or various things that are kind of sentimental to them uh, that they cherish, and they just they hold them on as pieces of comfort. Most kids don't carry around paint cans. But that's what Kathy did. Wherever she went, she had it. Um, she said that sometimes when Kathy would get upset, she would go to her room in the dorm and she would kind of just close herself in there and she would kind of rock back and forth holding on to that paint can. Sometimes they said she'd talk to the paint can. 
and she, she asked her about it one time, and Sister Rose, and she said she didn't want to tell her what was in it. Finally, after a couple weeks of this was going on, Sister Rose invited Kathy to breakfast, just the two of them, and they kind of had a little table off in the dormitory, uh, the cafeteria area, and the roar of all the kids eating, and they had their own little private space, and they began to talk and just share, and, and finally she said, Kathy, what, what's in that paint can? And she said she was quiet for a long time, and then finally she looked up and she said, it's my mother. She said, your mother? And she said, it's, it's my mother's ashes. And she held it up, and there was a label on the can with a name and a date of birth and a date of death. And she said, I never knew my mother. She threw me away when I was just a couple of days old. And I went around in foster homes for a long time and finally found out who she was and I wanted to go see her. And I went to her house, but she wasn't there. She was in the hospital and she was dying of AIDS. And I got to go to the hospital and I saw her the day before she died. And she told me that she loved me. My mother told me she loved me. And after she died, I went to the funeral home and they gave me her ashes. She started to cry and Sister Rose put her arms around Kathy, which is a little bit hard because she wouldn't give up that pinky. <laughs> but she held her for a long time. They had a connection after that. She always made sure to say hello to her. She walked by and greet her. Sister Rose always had an extra hug for Kathy. As we think about who we are in Christ, a lot of times, we have our paint can that we're carrying around. Something that we've got to hold on to for comfort. And we come to the church. And as we're in the church, we recognize that there are other people holding on to paint cans too. And that we gather one another together and we celebrate who we are in Christ. And we recognize that somehow, here in this place, we create a home. One that we are welcomed in, and one in which we turn around and we welcome others into. It's what baptism calls us to do. It's what the words of God call us to do that come from Isaiah 43, where God says, I am the Lord your God. You are precious in my sight. I love you. Do not fear, for I am with you. So when people come through our doors, may our response be, welcome home. Amen.